make it. I think we might have one more person coming in, unless Tim got in here. Okay, so uh, D and J started out. I guess I started selling fertilizer back in. Started using one of the products in '71, and uh, anyway, we went now to where we've got. Uh, we're doing business with about five different, five six different companies, um, and. Uh, one of the things I think the newest, some of the newest stuff is coming from Jerry Shepley, which I'll introduce him, have him come up, he'll talk first. But it's uh, been quite a deal. And I think there's some very interesting stuff coming and maybe more for, I hope, sustainable agriculture. Um, there's some things coming down the pipe. So that's why I guess we kind of got you here tonight. And uh, maybe, introduced you to a few of those things. So, uh, did not Jerry Shepley from Barnville, Iowa. He's got, uh, his company is Full Circle and he's a distributor for Black Earth. And, uh, okay, yeah, I think there's something back there to eat. So, okay, with that, slide here that we want to show you. Weather, we have changed it since 2021. Uh, we all had craziness, didn't we? We had the extremes from barometric pressure to winds to magnetism to weather pattern. Uh, as we traveled the country in the last three, four months, uh, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee about two weeks ago. From western, from eastern Iowa to Tennessee, there wasn't any good looking corn. Uh, a lot of sick beans. Uh, everybody was either way too wet or way too dry, and there was way too much, a whole bunch of way too dry. Uh, now we just started raining. So a lot of the South Dakota customers we work with are getting rain. The Minnesota guys are getting rain. The Wisconsin guys seem not to be getting rain, and the same with Indiana. Indiana's pretty tight. So it's been a tough one. So the million dollar question that everybody is asking is, now that my corn really looks good, is it really good? And uh, what we're telling these guys is uh, do some tissue testing. If you get into tassel, then grab some ears where you start counting rows because this is all over the board as to whether you get a good crop or a poor crop. It's basically hybrid specific. There's some hybrids that didn't need nutrients early, they needed them later, and so they weren't taking a lot of nutrients early. And some of those hybrids are, are doing very, very well, and some of these old racehorse hybrids are not doing so well right now. So. Time will tell. Some guys are going to get a bumper crop, and some guys had too much damage uh, too early. That's just that's just the way it was. I mean, it was when I grew up, uh, 14, 15 years old, working hired men for a lot of people in the neighborhood, and they would always tell me, "We live in Clayton County, Iowa, and in Clayton County, Iowa, it always rains five minutes before it's too late." Well, this year was maybe 20 seconds before it was too late, a minute before it was too late, but we got hurt. And so there's been a lot of permanent damage. You found as you drove down the road, you would see that, uh, boy, the corn's growing, we should see the, the rows fill in, and the rows are not filling in. Every day they're getting wider, you're seeing more down the row. And then uh, now that it rained, everything looks great, but I don't think it's that great. So, and you saw everybody's playing old, you saw everybody, the corn died on the sand hill, and you saw everybody's playing old. So uh, the guys that weatherproof their crops did better. Across the board, anybody with cover crops has a problem because the cover crops took a lot of that moisture out. We've got, I have a buddy that planted, probably got 1% germination, uh, had a little bit of rain and thought it was going to rain again and planted soybeans one inch deep in, in wheat that was about that tall, got about 1% germination. So uh, everybody's belly aching. Out. So the insurance agents have been told Hey, the boys with the cover crops, don't argue with the boys with cover crops because we want you guys to keep planting cover crops. So it, it's stay green, get green, and, and uh, but they hurt a lot of guys this year. The management tool is, and just something we've got our work around. So we'll talk a little bit, a bit about how to manage some of this stuff, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, some of the snafus that we saw this year. Because the drought was so severe, 
the little problems became big problems very, very quickly. And one of the big problems that we ran into this year was pH issues. So what we want to show you here is we would like this to be at about uh, you know, 6.4, 6.5 on pH. These particular pHs on this gentleman's farm are 7.2, 7.3. When you come over here to the calcium side on the base saturation, he's up over 80%. That's really, really strong calcium. And what was happening in that severe drought with the high pH, he was not, they were not getting any potassium uh, pulled up. And here, it looks like he's got pretty good potassium. Looks like his base saturation is pretty good, but they just could not get, anybody that had a pH issue got themselves into a lot of trouble. We had one guy that we went and visited, and he called us down because every 60 feet for about 10 feet wide, he had really nice corn, 40 feet of crap, 10 feet of good corn, 40 feet of crap. And we're saying, well, what did you do? Well, the co-op spread 0060 here this spring. No, that didn't do that. What was your pH last year? 5.9. That's not good, guys. So he went out that, that fall and spread some high cal lime and uh, overspread it. So the 10 feet that was really, really good, when he went out with the pH meters, the 10 feet that was really good corn had moved the pH up high enough to where it wasn't biting him in the butt. So we saw issues like that all year, guys. We saw a lot of herbicide damage on beans. We fixed a lot of herbicide damage on beans. We saw a lot more uh, iron sclerosis in beans that normally wouldn't have bothered these guys. So we have fixed a lot of stuff this year that normally wouldn't have happened had we had adequate rain. So uh, little things became big things and uh, we just got ourselves into trouble. So let's give you a little refresher here. What we're after for you guys is uh, we want to see a, tissue, a, a soil test looking at what's hanging on the soil colloid. This is the soil colloid test, so everything is, this is what's there. Then you do a water soluble test and you find out out of roughly these 300 parts per million of potassium, how much of that's actually usable out here. That's what we're really trying to find out. And while we're on that subject, let's talk about potassium here for a few minutes, guys. Normally, you can use a lot of 0060s and they're not getting guys in too much trouble. And this year, in the severe drought, the 0060 was biting a lot of guys in the butt. What happened? The chlorides got too high. So if you're using a lot of 0060 and you're using a lot of manures, you can paint yourself in the corner very, very quickly. So if any of you guys listened to the call with Scott Wall, we, we did a, a Zoom call uh, with Scott Wall. He's the head of the SAP lab in, in uh, New Age Lab. In, in Michigan. And he tells us that this year the number one problem that everybody had sending SAP tests in was that the chloride levels were too high. How did they get too high? If you're using a lot of manures, you've got salts in the manures. If you're using 0060, you've got more salts. And those high salts were really shutting down biology out here. And we would like to say to you guys, uh, if, if you, and, and you can get into more trouble where you actually have high sodium soil. Some of you guys have in uh, northwest Kansas have got some, or northeast Kansas have got some high, high natural sodium soil, high salts. So then you've got to be careful with manures and you've got to be more careful as you fill these chlorides up that they don't start coming up into the plants. So Dennis and I were talking to some of the Kansas boys earlier and they had some sap tests coming through and I was very nervous so I called Tracy K. And Tracy is the uh, expert pretty much in foliar feeding and trace minerals. I said, Tracy, what do we do if we get the chloride levels too high in the plant? And I wanted him to give me a real quick, easy answer, and he didn't. He said, you're, you're kind of off the luck. You're, you're really in some deep doo-doo if that happens to you. And the big thing that happens is that chloride in that plant is kind of like you guys letting the horse loose. And if the horse gets loose uh, and gets in the corn crib, you know what's going to happen. It's going to eat until it falls. And when you've got chlorides in that soil, the chlorides are going to get taken up by that plant until everything is full. And then along comes phosphorus knocking on the door saying, hey, we'd like to come up here and, and do you some good. And we're sorry, we don't have any room. So you'll watch a, a high chloride program really leave you guys short on, on phosphorus. And that's you know certainly something we want to, we want to address here. So, uh, I would like to, and, and the reason we want to talk about it is there's a couple really positive things that happen. We can see guys here that have uh, generally pretty decent uh, potassium levels hanging on the soil colloid, but water solubly they're at 10%. So if you're only 10% usable potassium out of everything you think you have here, then you need to front load that program. 
But what we're watching when we're starting to use liquid potassium is double O238. That's going to get you some potassium acetate. You can strip till some things like double O2517. There's some decent products that are much, much lower in, in sodium and in, in the chlorides than your double O60. Okay, we've got a, uh, uh, a polysulfate that's a low, low potassium level of, of potassium that would do you a lot of good. So we want you guys to do that because the pattern we're watching is that when we're using these liquid potassiums, we can dramatically see your water-soluble potassium move. That's the big key. We're not so concerned up here, but we can watch this stuff move on a water-soluble side. And we've done it for years, guys. The guy that we went to, Monticello, Iowa, and looked at this 40 foot of crap corn and 10 feet of good corn, uh, is a guy that did some testing for us. And he put on uh, two gallons of the 0023A, four gallons of the 0023A, and nothing. Handed us the sap, the test, showing the water soluble, says, well, what did I do? Well, the standard was 23, or 33, excuse me, the two gallons went to 45 and the four gallons went to 60. So he dramatically moved his water soluble potassium and that's exactly what we're watching happen. So we really want to encourage you guys to back off on the 0060s, go to the liquid potassium. You're much more usable. You're not getting into this early biological shutdown. Michigan State did this for you guys 40 years ago. They went out with 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 pounds of 0060 per acre and showed you specifically what happened to soil microbial activity the higher you got the chloride on it. So, uh, old, old technology, but guys, I really think it's important to talk about it because we're seeing such a huge difference in the biological shutdown. When it got dry and the salts got high, it really shut things down in these soils. And the people that were on the high potassium and had the high salt, salt levels got shut down very, very early. And nothing would translocate. It just really, you know, stoked up these soils where nothing good would happen. Again, one of the big things we're watching is as we start to understand foliar feeding is we need everything to travel on a calcium molecule in that plant. When you're growing corn, beans, anything you're growing up until that reproductive phase is traveling on a calcium molecule. And if you have very, very low soluble calcium, you're going to have a lot of problems. You're not going to have the growth you want. You're not going to get the, the yield you want. And so we always want to start watching the soluble calcium. And look at it, guys. If you do the math up here from 4,467 parts per million to 100, 103 or 117, you're only at 2.5% of your calcium is water soluble available. So work on that. Get those numbers up and watch if you're going to use anhydrous, start using a little bit of soluble calcium. For years, where Dennis and I met, was we were all using soluble calcium. We were using the, the uh, you know, uh, what, 9011, so calcium nitrates, those products, and we would pick these numbers up, but the anhydrous in the nitrification process, we actually helped clean that nitrification process up, and we didn't damage our soluble calcium with anhydrous. That's what anhydrous will do long term, offset that damage again by getting your soluble calcium done. So get these tests done, follow that, watch these, and so you don't get yourself in trouble. But here, you see where your sulfur levels are at, at 13 here and you're 45 on salt. You want this actually to be twice as high as this. See, so you, you get into certain guys' fields and they're up here at 120 and, and five down here. So we, we really wanna watch that because the number one problem out here in all SAP tests is high chlorides and then you shut your phosphorus down. So watch your manures, watch your sulfurs. And if you're doing carbons, the carbons do a nice job of grabbing on and, and grabbing some of these chlorides and not letting them be as, as big of a hindrance as, as what we normally would have. So we've got the same thing going on in trace minerals. We've got a couple uh, leachable minerals here. Sulfur's very leachable, boron's very leachable, but we've learned in the last few years that we do much, much better if we can pick these up. The, the yellow numbers down here are where we would like to see you guys get to you're probably always going to have to be putting some sulfurs on and some borons on because they're highly leachable. We can build you guys up in, in zinc and, and you don't have to be using much. We can build you up in copper. Uh, manganese is a tough one sometimes, it, it, but I want to tell you guys that in terms of uh, you building this number, well I put manganese on every year. I put manganese sulfate on, I did this. 
you're not going to see this number move very quickly. You can move your zinc, you can move the copper, but if you've got good biological activity, you'll grab this stuff. Don't go broke throwing manganese on, expecting to see this happen, that great things happen on the soil test. It doesn't. Watch the tissue test, foliar feed, do those things, but it is difficult to move the manganese in the soil. Watch your irons, don't get them too high. A lot of guys have very, very high iron soils. The carbon has been a great product for us knocking down some of this iron and converting that, knocking that third charge off the iron to make that a whole lot more usable. But this is a huge, huge difference of what you run into. So I did a field day in Western Iowa a year ago. I had a customer that I had never met. I had sold him a semi-load of, of uh, trace minerals. And he was just absolutely tanked on everything on the sheet. He had never put sulfur on his soil. He had never used boron. He had never used a trace mineral in 40 years of farming. So I said, I looked at his soil and I said, the best thing I can do is to tell you to get some trace minerals on. So we're doing the field day. The, the, at noon, we stopped. The, I was on the wagon out in the field. We're looking at everything. And at noon, uh, we, did, we started doing a meeting after we ate. And, and this guy raised his hand when he started talking. I knew who he was. And he said, I got a question for you. He said, on my farm, I bought a new round baler 40 years ago. I, I you know, was in the round bale forever. So he said, we were getting one round bale per acre on our, on our hay. That's all we could ever get. He said, now I get newer balers and maybe they make a little tighter bale, but I can only get one round bale per acre. And he said, I put 100 pounds of carbon on that you sold me for my farm. And I did what you told me for balancing out trace minerals. He said, I took to the Spencer Iowa hay sale. He said, I took three and a half round bales per acre, got $187 a ton. I said, you ought to have enough money to buy some more carbon. He said, yes, I did. I will do that. So he said, my question is, do trace minerals do that much good? I said, I think he answered your question. So this is what we want to say to you guys, and Trace is going to reiterate all this when he starts speaking. Get these numbers up, guys. It is huge. And, and the other thing that I want to tell you is, if you're watching your soils and you say, I don't have the biological activity in my soil. I use these bugs in the jug over here and I do bugs in the jug over here. I'm not happy with my biological activity. Get your sulfur levels where they're supposed to be, get your boron levels where they're supposed to be and your biological activity will come. You'll get it guys, it's, it's really, that's the beginning. But if you're crashed on boron and sulfur, you can throw all the bugs in the jug you want on that soil. It really doesn't do what you want it to do. And we're all the salesman's not going to tell you that, but we've seen cases where, you know, hey, can I buy your bugs in the jug? No, watch a wait a year. You know, there's not going to be money well spent here. So, so really, really watch some of that. You know, on the, was that yellow line what they're supposed to be? Is that? Yeah, the so yellow line is where they're supposed <coughs> to get there. Yeah. So now let's look at a Haney report. And the Haney report is giving us more information. We've got the colloid test, we've got the water soluble test. And Haney came along a few years ago and said, hey, we've got some criteria here and let's make sense out of it. So my beef with the whole industry out here for years and years was that 25 years ago, I figured out that they were lying to us when they said it's about the replacement theory. Everybody would walk up to me and say, Jerry, are you a Reams man or are you an Albright man? Because they were both replacement guys. They said, look, and here's where the theory came from. In the early 19th, 60s, they came out with soil labs. You had a and L, you had Midwest, and these guys took a six foot tall corn plant, bean plant, alfalfa plant, they analyzed everything that was in them and they said, look what you took off that field. You have to put that back. And we all did. Here's the program from the co-op. You took this off, you put this back. We're on the replacement theory. And I said, that's a wrong theory. Why would that be a wrong theory? If you burn the corn plant, the bean plant, the alfalfa plant, weigh the ash, you've got less than 10% ash. What's that tell you? 10% came from the soil, 90% was free through photosynthesis. Now, your million dollar question, I knew that was wrong, so I just explained the right theory to you. How do you get that 90% back? If nature gave you more than it took, how do you get it? I'm not gonna tell you how you do that. When you guys balance your organic nitrogen, balance your carbon nitrogen ratio 15 to 1 so these bottom numbers is where we want you guys that's the two big things you balance these things out have some carbon and uh, shazam now you start getting the value out of what nature gave you nature gave you more than it took convert it make it happen and get somewhere and then if you do you can see down here additional nitrogen credit via the Haney report is a seven 
So what happens is when you start balancing your carbons, your carbon nitrogen ratios, nitrogen, um, you start building your own nitrogen, you start affixing. And as we walk through this, uh, we're going to show you how I've done that, how you guys building this, working with this, can dramatically cut your nitrogen usage and dramatically cut your phosphorus usage. So we're going to explain that to you. So here's what Haney is telling you. When you balance these things out here, this is how that plant feeds. Everything's a carbon-nitrogen ratio, see? So, so learn to balance these things, and for the organic guys, it's huge. We do a lot of meetings, and you get in the Amish community, and the guy says, well, you just explained why the, uh, the, the garden turned yellow and the creek pasture turned yellow. We spread this uh, chicken manure down there with all the wood chip bedding in it, see? And you, you're getting smart. You just figured it out, guys. The carbon was way too high, and you, you put yourself in the bus with it, okay? So get yourselves a Haney report. When you're playing around with cover crops, you can, we've had, I had the number one cover crop salesman in the Midwest came to me one day privately. Don't tell anybody I was here, but these cover crops aren't working. I said, they will work. You have to not be putting down 20 tons of, of residues and expect you're gonna get this bumper crop because somebody said so. You know, you still have to balance this out no matter what you guys are doing, so. So we farm. Uh, I've got a farm, and uh, we did something interesting on that farm. We started watching our ability to produce nitrogen. We started watching our ability to produce phosphorus, because what we did was, in 2016, we went out and put 500 pounds of carbon down in one shot. And I did that because I wanted to be able to look you guys in the eye and say, look, this is what can happen. This is what, we can, what happens if we do this. So here we are in 2020, we had just gotten done uh, with a crop of organic corn. Previous to that, we had some alfalfa in. So we started out, with, so we had combined the corn, rolled up the corn stalks, and, and uh, planted rye. So we pulled this, this test, and uh, we're 55 on a P1. Now I want to tell you that when I bought the farm in 2000, I think I bought that farm, I was a 13 on P1. Since 2000, I have never put a phosphorus product on that farm. Okay, so how did I get up to 55? And uh, how did I get almost a two to one to 136 on P2? Okay, so what I did that year was I started doing a nitrogen, uh, I started doing sugar amino nitrate testing. And I wanted to know how much nitrogen I had, so I figured out I could do something really crazy. At the end of 2020, I had enough nitrogen that I had. I thought I could grow another crop of corn, so I grew two years of organic corn back to back with no manure and no nitrogen, no nitrogen of any sort. And I still have enough. I still had enough nitrogen for another three, four crops of corn because it's a six-year test. So we came back the next year, and look what I did. So this is second-year organic corn. This is 2021, and we pulled the soil test at the end of the end of December. So we went from a 5-1 to a 6-1 PA uh, organic matter. How do you do that, guys? Because I'm, I'm here to tell you that defies all rules. Because if you're going to go from a 5-1 from a to a 5-2, you need 10,000 pounds of organic matter. So to go this far, I had to have 100,000 pounds of organic matter, and I took the corn stalks off. How'd that happen? We got all kinds of guys doing it on bean stubble that go like a tenth of a point, like 3-1 to 3-2. So how can you do this, guys? You do it because you get enough biological activity that the microbe is living, breathing, moving, dying, living, breathing, moving, dying. And that's how we did this because it sure wasn't real organic matter, okay? So that's the potential that's here and I'm not the only guy doing this stuff. So we were 55 on P1 in, in 2020, a year later we went to 75. There was no phosphorus put on that field. How do you pick up your phosphorus that high? So I'm gonna explain it to you guys in that, uh, oh, I got it in my pocket, no wonder I can't find it. <coughs> so you have in, in your um, calcium and phosphorus, you have what they call a, a tricalcium phosphate. You've got a triple bond of calcium and phosphorus that are hooked together. And if you guys have ever been mixing fertilizers and you accidentally got some phosphorus and some calcium <coughs> together, you know how well they love each other? You just jumbled everything up, didn't you? okay? So what we have to do here in the soil is you have to unhook the calcium from the phosphorus. How do you do that? You use the carbon. The carbon is what separates that calcium, that tricalcium phosphate. 
and, and gets that phosphorus available for you. And it also, will, I'll show you in a few slides, it moves the calcium up. So your soluble calciums come up, you're available on the colloid calcium come up, and your phosphorus comes up. So that's why we're, we're kind of promoting the, uh, uh, the carbons here. So not only, oh, excuse me, not only did we, um, Not only did we move the, the P1s, because we down here, we went to 75 and 156, so we, we moved about 20 points on, on each of those. We moved the potassium up from 122 to 177. Now, we did put a little potassium on. We're low in potassium, we're a very high mag soil. I mean, we're running 26, you know, 26, 29 base saturation. We're at six miles off the Mississippi River, and if you ever wanted something to do, come over, we'll pick up lime rock together and talk to over. High, high mag soil. So we fight to keep the potassium uh, up on, on these, this land, and it is getting better because we moved some of that up. But that's the, this is what, what you guys can do. We're telling you, we're showing you what we did when, and we go down to Missouri and different places, and if you start following this, we basically always see this P1 go up, P1, P2 go up. And, and then biologically, as you see things move, uh, you know, good things just start to happen. So then on the water soluble side, we watched good things happen as well. So the water soluble potassium went from, from 14, went up here to 19. Potassium went up from 33 to 51. And we had our water soluble calcium respectively good. We want to be between about 120 and 200 on this water soluble calcium number, guys. And we got that real loose. And again, when you start separating that calcium and phosphorus, we've got enough phosphorus, guys, for the next 50 years out there. We've just got to get this stuff loosened up. So for all the years that we threw on, you know, MAP and DAP, and uh, how come our numbers aren't over the moon? 90% of that stuff tied up when it hit the ground. And if you don't think that's true, go read the literature from every company that's selling a liquid product. They're going to tell you that dry products are about 10% available, and it's all this dry calcium tie-up. <clears throat> so that's why they got not get sued for telling you that. So we dramatically moved our calcium higher, uh, moved our soluble magnesium higher, which is a good thing because it's, it's in ratio with this, and you know the rest of this is you know pretty normal stuff. So we want you guys to be building these numbers in your soil, and uh, we we think you absolutely can and, and should. <clears throat> now we also did a Haney, and uh, we wanted to show you guys what was going on on the Haney. So. Look at some of the, you know, the potassium got better a year later uh, with second year corn. Uh, bacteria levels weren't quite as good because we pulled that test January 1st. The, the ground thawed out. We don't you know, usually be using a pickaxe to, to get that out. But look at the carbon levels are good. We want 300 to 500. But we're pretty much on the money here. Why all this stuff is cooking, guys, isn't there some, that there's some magic fertilizer being used is that when you stay in balance here, on your carbon nitrogen ratio and your organic nitrogen and you have some carbon, you make bacteria and things start to cook. Now look at the nitrogen numbers here that we're fixing nitrogen. We're way up, we're way up at 32, we're over 27 over here. So that's what you guys want to look at and if you want to really start separating them in from the boys on who can produce nitrogen, we're breathing 78% nitrogen guys and we need to you know, continue that. So let's go up to South Dakota. <clears throat> and in South Dakota, Leo Volta uh, put on, in, in 2021, 245 pounds of dry carbon. Here's his numbers. Look what happened to the phosphorus numbers over here. Look how they filled in, guys. But look what happened with his calcium. He went from 462 to 952 on calcium. And, and we went up there and said, how did you raise my calcium? How did you raise my phosphorus? We go from 9 to 15 up here on a P1. We separated the calcium from the phosphorus, guys. So he picked up all that calcium, all that phosphorus. He's a 13 on his ability to nitrogen effects. He's a 15 over here. His carbon levels were at 82. We picked him up to 219. So a uh, very, very happy guy. They were very, very dry last year. We went up and did the meeting for him, and he said, I'm a happy guy. I averaged uh, 177 bushel corn, I averaged 49 bushel beans, and I averaged about 90 bushel wheat. So he says, we, we, we paid for anything that we put on here, and we're just, we're watching the soil texture change, but he had no idea that he could move his 
calcium to that bar by using carbons to uh, separate that tricalcium phosphate. Uh, second field he did, uh, same thing, 2021, 188 pounds. His goal was to get about 500 pounds, four to 500 pounds on in two years. So look at the numbers here, look how they filled in over here. So his calcium was at 216 and he went up to 623. So 400 pounds of calcium, 400 parts per million of calcium in a pickup like that is absolutely huge. Bacterial numbers in that soil moved. Your Sovita soil burst moved from 110 to 230. Uh, carbons went up, everything just went. And then he, he was in the fall of the year, he's in December doing this. So look where his carbon nitrogen ratios are guys, off the wall. He burned out, there, there wasn't anything happening, see? So, so you'll see them sometimes, but that, you know, it's not anything to really get crazy about. Now, here's something I want all of you guys to look into doing. <clears throat> and instead of going to Midwest Labs, you're gonna go down the road to Kearney and you're going to go to Regent, okay? And what Regent is going to give you is a, is a uh, uh, TLFA test. Okay, and what they're going to tell you in the TLFA test, that's Lance like Gunderson's clinic or, or his lab down there, if you guys are familiar with Lance. Okay, so what they're going to tell you is the total biomass of uh, bacteria. They're going to tell you the total biomass of fungus. So I think everybody should do one of these because if you really want to know if you're building soil, if you really want to know what's going on out there, find out how diverse you are and what you're doing out here because they'll, they'll group you into down here. Here's your total bacteria at 774. Uh, they come down here, here's your total fungus at 177. Now, where are you guys supposed to be at on fungal to bacterial ratios? In a perfect world, we would want you to be one part of fungus to one part of bacteria. A timber soil would need to be very dominant on, that, on, on fungus. Uh, sand prairie in western Nebraska would be very bacterially dominant. We want to get close to that one to one ratio. So here he's about probably four to one, <clears throat> four or five to one in, in the fungal bacterial ratio. And uh, the, look, at the, look at the date up here, it's, it's 2014. So I worked with this customer for about the last 10 years. He grew, he did a uh, uh, DLFA test uh, this last summer. We went to the Regent meeting in uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa with Lance and uh, and he brought this test down, and Lance was a speaker down there, and, and he, we made an appointment at noon on Tuesday, whatever day it was. We wanted Lance to interpret this for us. So what we did was, uh, this is the old test. So here's where we are now. From 2014, in that eight year period of time, we took his total bacteria from 774 to 1500. So we more than doubled his bacteria levels in the soil. Uh, the gram positives, the gram negatives made a big difference. Now, we want you guys to watch these gram negatives because here's what happens if you guys are using a lot of Mopidec and Remensa. They kill the gram negative bacteria off and you'll never see it in a soil test. So if you're wondering why you're using all this calendar and things are not happening very well for you, come and pull one of these and find out where your gram negatives are. And if you're real short on them, then you, you know, you've got to quit using Mopidec and some of that stuff. So, we just want you to be concerned about it. So as far as undifferentiated bacteria, it's 4,900, use a 500 over here. Too. So we're watching a huge, huge, huge change in, uh, you know, now in, in the deal. So a 540 to 177. So he dramatically moved his fungal populations up. He dramatically narrowed his, his, his base up. So we're sitting there with Lance, and the joke between this customer and I is, I will say to, to you guys, if, if you guys are working with Dennis and Dennis is not getting you to move these numbers, I mean, if you're working following his program diligently and numbers aren't moving, then you fire Dennis. Okay. So this customer said to Lance Gunderson, I want to see if I have to fire Gary. I, I might have to get rid of him. This is a bad test. We might have to get rid of him. I was just one bullet, you know. And uh, so anyway, Lance finally said something interesting to him. He said, you've got a fantastic test here, and you have a fantastic test here because you used a lot of cover crops. And the guy bit his tongue, and he wanted to hear the rest of what Lance had to say before he told him what he was going to tell him. So what he told him was, look, you have a huge amount of, of biomass. You know, your biomass has increased dramatically. Um, you know, you went from the 1400 up here to, to you know, almost uh, 10 times. 
But when you come down here to um, your protozoas are good, your all your microbial stuff, but now you've got 1,500 different species. How do you go from 500 species to 1,500? How do you get a thousand more species of microbial colonizations in your soil, guys? If you do cover crops, what do they tell you? If you plant multiple species, you're going to get more bacteria, right? And different species of bacteria. How do you get a thousand more bacterial species? What would you do to get that diversity of species? Okay. So I'm going to draw that out for you here a little bit because here's what I think. Here, I'm going to show you what this guy basically did out here. So he was a big believer in boron and, and sulfur, and he balanced his, uh, he, he, he uh, used a lot of growth now, not a lot, uh, used some fish, and uh, why is this important? Why is growth pal important? Growth pal is, is uh, ocean water off the coast of, of uh, Australia. And when you mineral test it, it's got about 60 different minerals in it. What we think is happening, guys, is that each one of those minerals is feeding a different set of bacteria in that soil. Because he went up a thousand different species, okay? So with that said, uh, what else would give you that diversity of species? Fish is going to give you some diversity of species again. So I want to take you guys back to about 25 years ago when I first got into this. We went down to, to Illinois. We met a gentleman that had worked with uh, uh, big John Green Giant growing vegetables and corn and beans and everything in, in South of Rockford, Illinois. And uh, we sat down with him and he had tables that were probably from here to the wall. And he took 40 years of soil tests from a dairy farmer that had used a gallon of fish per year and he laid them out. And what was interesting was all the numbers were getting better and better and better over the 40 year period of time. Everything progressively got better. Or this guy didn't want to quit farming because he was basically having all inputs to buy. And so the fatherly advice from this gentleman was, Gary, put a gallon of fish on every acre that you sell stuff to on your own farm. Use a gallon, minimum of a gallon per acre. Didn't really get it at the time, but now when we're watching these multiple species, and where you can pick up a thousand different species in your soil in an eight-year period of time, something is feeding those species. So fish is a piece of the puzzle, and the girl pal is a piece of the puzzle. And then the other aspect of this is he hasn't used a ton of carbon, but he's got some carbon. <clears throat> so when you do that, and and, you're, and he's using, he's doing something else that a lot of you guys don't want to do because we don't want to take the time. He's using your product, the products out of Israel. Okay, so there's 05234, 12610. That's that's what's in Gatorade, that's what's in Pepsi Cola. They're a finer food grade than the fast acids are. So he's used that, he's used a biological that I make, which is mycorrhizae, and he's trying to get the mycorrhizae established. But when you do this and you build a root mass that has six foot roots and six foot laterals, uh, and you can, and, and everybody in the neighborhood is growing 200 bushel corn, and, and you do as well, but you have four or five times the biomass, who won? You did, you've got this huge biomass. Now wait a minute, if 90% is free up here, and this is where you grow soil, why, it is, why is the soil so loose, why is the texture so good? And when he goes to the bank every year, and has his annual physical with his banker, the banker says, when are you gonna retire and come to work for me? Why don't I want to work for you? Well, because I need you in here because too many guys are buying their crops. Too many guys have way too many inputs. You have the lowest inputs of any customer that I have. You have the highest return of any customer I have. Come and work for me. I need you to do this. So the vet comes on, runs the cattle through the shoe. Why do you have the best cattle of anybody I run cattle through the shoe for? They don't have a cough. They are healthy. You can just tell they're really into an animal. Well, he says there is no one secret. But when you start understanding the biomass production per acre, nobody will, you know, he's not doing crazy things, but if you do this for, uh, on an ongoing basis and you produce this huge root mass, how many microbes can live in this huge root mass? It's not about what you can hold in your hand as a, as a root. It's absolutely huge in terms of where you can get to and, uh, and how that's going to work. that have, that are going to give you that diversity of species. And so what Lance 
Gunderson, having never seen anything move that far that fast, said to this, this particular friend of mine, this farmer, he said, you must have really used a lot of cover crops. You must be a huge cover crop guy. And the guy said, don't get some. And I said, why? Well, you, you have to. You have to. Look what you did. And then use it. He said, I'll take that back. He said, I probably used a little oats one year in the spring. So I get out there early enough. Once in a while, I use a little bit of rye. But, but we plow here with 20 different species east of Rochester, Minnesota. No, I can't make cover crops work. I can't get them to take in the fall of the year. They're not up high enough for really I don't think they'd be much good. So Lance is just absolutely baffled because somebody did something that really blew him away. What Lance is more is, is used to looking at is at the region meeting conference, there was something interesting. These guys stand up and they show you how their numbers move and their fungal and bacteria ratios came together and all these wonderful things happen. And the guys, oh by the way, I'm from southern Alabama and uh, last Christmas it was 86 degrees. Well, what did we have going on Christmas Day? Twenty below zero, two feet of frost. Okay, well we're not growing, we're not growing cover crops and producing biomass. So we, we have to figure out a smarter, better way to do that, and that's get some diversity out here. You don't have to go broke doing this stuff, guys. But get the carbons in here, get this gigantic root masses that make this stuff happen, and and you'll get where this guy got. And and so. So get a baseline for you guys. We tell you get an any baseline, know where your carbon is. Get a PLFA baseline. See where your total biomasses are at. Watch where your total fungal biomasses are at, and then grow them. And if you're not getting them done, come talk to us. We'll help you. Out. Maybe it was a chemical. Maybe it was something that got overdosed. Or maybe something was. You know, we're not getting the nail on the head, but but that's really what it has to come down to is we need to. Narrow up the fungal bacteria ratios where we're closer, and he did that. He found about three to one. So <clears throat> go down and watch what what uh, uh, Etrix did down there in North Carolina with 400 and, with 459 bushel of corn. Look where his fungal bacteria ratios are in those fields. Is they're almost a two to one. I was at the meeting, the cover crop meeting in Bloomfield, in Bloomfield, Missouri, when he spoke the first time, and uh, when he spoke the first time. Uh, what happened was at the meeting down there, they gave all the vendors at the, at the show five minutes to talk. We got up and said, hey, we're Black Earth, we sell carbon, and we're trying to build the carbon up. Hendricks gets up, takes his hat off, and bows, and, and, and like this with the, with the meeting going on, like, hey, here's the Black Earth guys with carbon, I love you guys, and this is how I got to where I'm at. This is what moved my, my numbers to where they are. And um, Russell Hendricks down there is married to Liz Haney. That's that's uh, uh, Rick Haney's daughter. So uh, that's kind of how that connection is made there. So guys, get the LFA. Go to uh, Carney, Nebraska, to Region Labs, and uh, Pleasanton, uh, South by Carney, I believe. So uh, we've had uh, uh, we've had him on our phone uh, conferences before. He's a good guy. Okay, so. Let's buzz through here and we want to show you some things that happened. So here's a five year test. Uh, this was even before we started doing carbon. When we were just trying to get these soils turned around and balanced out with trace minerals and things, we were moving organic matters up. I showed you mine, we commonly do that. If you can move organic matter, you can raise your CECs. So what was this farm worth at a 13, 14, 15 CEC? And now if you're going to sell that land, we've got a high CSA number of the on the FSA office. So what, what land's going to bring more money? I see, see, they want to bring some cold uh, nutrients better. We can move magnesium on the soil test. We can move calcium on the soil test. And we have guys that didn't know we could do that. So I ran into this gentleman at a meeting I was doing one night for a fish guy, and he came to me and he said, I got a problem. Um, I don't have any potassium. My dad had open heart surgery. We had to pay a hundred some thousand dollar doctor bill to get his heart fixed. Dad didn't put any potassium on for five years, and this is where I'm at. Can I do that with fish? No, we'll help him. And so we moved him, guys. This is on the mineral side of it. In five years, we got him from 120, 40 bushel corn up to over 200 bushel. And uh, then, because this guy had used so much calcium, when you start balancing out that soil correctly, you just watch these numbers start balancing out. You'll get your pH to start coming back in range and just falling naturally. So. 
um, these are some nasty tab numbers here as far as you being able to grab, to grab nutrients and just not going to grab them there. And even his base saturation of, of you know, potassium moved dramatically. We want to get him up about 3.5. And incidentally, if you're looking at some of these numbers, why they're erratic is this is an Amish farm. Hey, kids, go get me some samples. They're not GPS. It's like where the Amish get to feel like going. And we just threw them out there. So can your phosphorus move? Okay. If, if, so we started out with this guy in 2009. We're 59, 131. Two years later, we dropped. We came back up again. Well, he didn't fire us here, and what we found out was he had an iron problem in that field. We corrected the iron problem, and back up he came. See? So that's what you got to look at. You got to stamp who, uh, you know, come and talk to us, we'll straighten it out. So here's the catch, guys. The most leachable minerals are also the most reactive nitrogen, boron, sulfur, chloride, and now we have to molly. The molly is very, very leachable. We've got to get that on here. And that's why we're really wanting you guys to watch your molly and your soil test tissue test to read it and we've got some trace minerals with molly in it. We want some in pearl, we want some foliar fat, and you'll really, really do yourself some good. Now with that said, here's your biochemical sequence of nutrients. Wait a minute, it's N, P, and K. No, it's not. It starts with sulfur up here and then boron, and then boron kicks with silica in here, and silica reacts with the calcium, and then calcium reacts with nitrogen. So nitrogen is number five. Not top of the pile. <clears throat> so uh, this is a big learning curve right here. We've got a gentleman with his son from the agronomist, and the dad says to his son, Hey son, did you learn that biochemical sequence in the agronomy school? So the kids have never heard of it. But this is this is where it all starts, and if you're going to sit down here and look at your soil test, we're looking at all nine of them. We're not looking at MPK. Yes, we look at MPK, but it's not on the top of the pile. And it's not your, your big answer. So you also have to not only look at soil pH, you have to look at the electron movements in your pH because everything's in a constant flux and everything's in a constant movement. And soil's really an aquatic environment because you've got a water molecule between all these soil colloids and you're exchanging gas exchanging everything. So we're in constant motion between aerobic and anaerobic and it, it just pretty much has to be there. So let's take a minute and we're gonna show you guys what we like out here. This is a new sap test. So you've got a, a dark green line, you've got a light green line. So the dark line is old crop, the, the old leaf, and this is new leaf. So when you do this test, you're actually looking at, at two things. You're using twice the money, but you're doing two different tests. Now, if you're looking at the difference between a sap test and a tissue test, what the tissue test is doing, they're coming in and they're drying that leaf down. They're turning it into powder, and then they're doing a mineral assay on the powder. The issue is that if you're doing a, throw a point to two different labs, things we 
got to do is calcium up front and potassium late. And we were throwing potassium in the middle of the mix. We were throwing the physiology of these plants off and thought we were doing everybody a favor, and, and we didn't do it right. But the SAP test is a, is a really good thing because it's, it's really, really accurate. Now, with a lot of these EDTA minerals, if you guys are doing weekly tissue tests, there's a real good chance that you're reading what is already hanging there from a week ago. And it's a false read. And we've been in fields where the guys are doing that, and your naked eye is seeing there's a problem here. This isn't really that accurate. This shouldn't be showing that severe, but the tissue test says we're good. Go to a SAP test, guys. It, it really is, is giving us a bigger insight into what's going on. We think we've got much better accuracy. Um, it's going to cost you a little more money. Now, what they'll do for you is you can pull the lab and tell them you want to do a test. They will send FedEx to your door, and FedEx will hand you the box. Dump your box into the FedEx box, and it's overnight. They give you a discount grade on the postage. And, and so you don't have to worry about going down to the post office or UPS or wherever you want to use and wondering, boy, how do I overnight that? And what, how do we do it? That actually will come to your door, guys. So that really takes the load off a lot of this and, you know, you know makes it work a lot better. So you're going to take about a half a pound of uh, rubber leaves and a half a pound of rubber leaves and don't take them and bend them because you don't want the juice leaking out of those. But that will make a huge, huge difference for you and what we, what we see. So we've used these pretty exclusively with the Vulcan minerals with Albion here, and we're seeing really, really good results. I don't think there's been a case where we have not seen changes. And, and uh, some of the changes that, you know, things I told you earlier, where we worked with a lot of herbicide damage this year, uh, last year was a lot of uh, dicamba damage, this year we haven't had that much yet. Uh, and for uh, iron sclerosis, and, and the guys with the beans are really upset because
and then he sells both of those products to the farmer. What I'm asking you guys to understand is that rock phosphate, zinc sulfate, any of these soluble fertilizers, except nitrogen, all of these other soluble fertilizers, want to return to their more stable form. Jerry talked about leaching and losing minerals, losing them from the system, or all of a sudden they become, they appear. Is that magic? No, it's talk, it's, we're talking about solubility versus insolubility. We're talking about edible or inedible, okay? So what we want to do is we want to talk about edible. What happens when you add sulfuric acid, I'm, I'm sorry, phosphoric acid that we just made, phosphoric fertilizer, into a mix of ammonia to make 1034O or who knows what? What happens? You change the molecule and then, but it's still a concentrate. What happens when we take this phosphorus, soluble phosphorus fertilizer and apply it to the soil? Or zinc sulfate or manganese sulfate or iron sulfate. What happens to these soluble forms of elements that are in a concentrate? They immediately break apart because that's what solubilization means. And they look for their love, their life. What happens when we apply phosphorus to it, phosphoric acid to the soil? We create rock phosphate. We create a calcium deficiency by applying a highly soluble phosphorus force to the soil. Do you understand what I just said? I'm talking about a macronutrient. The same thing happens to micronutrients. The same thing happens to boron, zinc, molybdenum, <coughs> nutrients that we're just applying a pound or two per acre. The same thing happens. The goal to plant nutrition is to make the nutrients edible. Okay? I hope you guys enjoyed this meal. This, to me, it was really yummy. I get Mexican food almost every day of my life. It gets old. It gets old the second day. The first day, they, they, in my bathroom, there's, oh, you won't have any fingernails. You, know, so you understand what I'm saying? So, anyway, we want to make the nutrients edible. Okay? I'm going to invite you guys to state dinner, okay? And we're going to bring a big old Piedmont bowl in the room, and I'm going to see how many of you guys are happy about the state dinner I'm going to provide for you. Is it in the plant available? Is it in the human available form? No, hell no. You got the crap beat out of you, didn't you, by that stupid bowl? Okay, so what I'm getting at is I want to get in your minds that the plant isn't a sponge and that everything we put in the soil isn't for the plant to uptake. We have to make it available. The more available, readily available we make the food, the less energy the plant and the soil has to make in order to take it up to become part of nutrition. Plant nutrition requires the elements to be edible. Okay? How many of you remember playing Pac-Man? what Pac-Man is, it was a video game, and all it was was a stupid round ball that had a mouth. And it went around eating, and all the whole game was was the goal to eat as many little squares as you can. Many people still think that that's how plant nutrition works, and it's not that at all, or human nutrition or anything. It has to be biologically available. Okay? That's right, come So, this is the smallest protein in the world. Do you guys have any idea of the average size of a protein? About a thousand times as big. The average protein, an enzyme, muscle, is about a thousand times bigger than this. Okay? This is composed of positive charges and negative charges. And we're talking about, about the uh, magnets, right? These little gray things are the charge ligands that hold one element to the next. Basic chemistry, right? We're gonna get really fun because I'm gonna open up the world, okay? White ones, little white ones are called hydrogen, okay? Little red ones with two charges, hydrogen has one charge, 
Oxygen has two charges. Any of you ever heard of ozone? Ozone is three charges and it's highly unstable in any environment. As soon as you apply it to an environment, it immediately goes to two charges. That's what ozone does, is it neutralizes things, okay? The little black one in the middle, does anybody know what that is? Your favorite topic, carbon, okay? The little black one, how many charges does it have? If you can count my big fat fingers. Four charges, okay. This little blue chingadera right here is nitrogen. It has four charges. This group right here is, is a grouping, a chemical grouping called group amino. It's the amine group. This is carboxylic acid or acid group, amino acid. Two or more amino acids that combine are called a Protein. Okay, see how we're building this conversation here? Okay, so I have I have an amino acid here. I flip it over and I have his twin brother on this side, another amino acid. I know all of you are dying to know what is that little chain of deer in the middle. Anybody see it? This little shiny dude? This little shiny dude is a metal. Metal protonate. Metallocene. Say it. Damn, people. Metallocene. Ready? Metallocene. I can't hear you. <laughs> Say it again. Metallocene. It's not complicated, but man, I hear it a lot of different ways. Metal protonate metallocene. Okay? What we've done is we've actually copied nature. It's not real complicated to copy nature if you know how to do it. You have to know what nature is doing. Okay, how many of you remember high school chemistry? Or college chemistry, anything, or even some basic agronomy? I'm gonna isolate these two little amino groups, and instead of this four charged metal in the middle, I'm gonna put a four charged carbon. And this little oxygen that has two charges is gonna come back around to the front. Does anybody recognize this molecule? It's the, the most widely used agrochemical in the world. Water. Close, that's a great answer. I love that answer, by the way. Urea. If I was in Mexico, I'd say, urea cabrones. And I'm gonna not say that here. Okay. Urea is the most widely used agrochemical in the world. Do you know what the second most widely used agrochemical in the world is? It's not phosphorus. It's glyphosate. Damn, people. Is there one person in this room that's not gonna use glyphosate this year? One person in this room that's not gonna use urea this year? <laughs> I know you. Okay. Now, this molecule, I'm going to make it, okay, I'm going to go, let me go back. Do you know how many charges calcium has? Do you know how many charges zinc has? Iron has? Soluble nutrient available, iron, zinc, manganese, copper, calcium, magnesium. Two. Every single one of them have two. If they have three, four, one, they're not available. They're called reduced or oxidized. Okay? The color of red soil, iron, insoluble iron. Okay? So, now who has a green truck? A green tractor, I mean. <laughs> Damn, people, green tractors, right? Why is it green? Because it has an oxidized paint. It has zinc and, uh, and copper in the paint that is highly oxidized so that you can paint your steel tractor green and you can get rain on it for the next 10 years and it won't rust if you don't chip the paint because it's already highly oxidized. This is all basic chemistry, people. This is good stuff. Okay, how many charges does calcium have? 
see how we're learning here. How many does zinc have? Don't look away. How many does manganese have? Magnesium have? Copper has? Okay, young lady, I need some help. We got a bunch of more guys. <laughs> this little silver ball in the middle is either zinc, calcium, manganese, magnesium in a bioavailable form. How many charges does it have on that? Don't look at me. Right over here. You can hold it. It's not going to bite. I promise you. Four stinking charges, and you guys are thinking that I'm trying to screw you out of something, right? I'm telling you one of the secrets of life is that you need to understand how science works and how nature works. This is called covalent bonding. It's a shared bond, another shared bond. So this is really one bond, and this is one bond. So my zinc and my iron really only have one bond, but it's a covalent bond, so it looks like two. And all that did is that keeps this from oxidizing when it's exposed to the air, like the painted tractor. But guess what? Because this is stabilized, the plant doesn't even know this is here. And I offer this protein to the plant, and the plant says, oh man, you just gave me the ribeye, medium done, with a little bit of salt, perfect. We apply this to the plant, guess what the plant does? The plant recognizes the characteristics of this molecule, doesn't even know the calcium or the zinc is there, and it says, I've got to feed this to the most important parts of my plant. You know what they are? The growing points. The, uh, there's, they're embryos. I call them embryos. There's the root tips, there's the apex, the growing points, there's the lateral buds, and there's the most important thing that we grow. We don't grow leaves. We grow seeds and fruit, yes or no? The secret to nutrition is to have the ability to fool the plant so that it will translocate, it will change the rules. I want to give another young lady up here. Let's ask that. That's my wife. Young lady, can I have your help up here, please? Please. <laughs> Did she say no? That's okay, I can get another guy up here. I mean, you want that? Do you want it to go down that way? I can go over there. Everybody has to turn around. And you know what? There, there's a saying in Mexico, after you eat, people start getting drowsy. They call it el mal del puerco. You know what el mal means, right? Bad mal is bad, right? El mal del puerco, you know what puerco is? A pig. The, the bad, it's like, it's like an effect when after you eat, you start getting drowsy, and mal del puerco. I don't want these guys to all have to turn around. Please come up here. Do y'all know what the difference is between a macro and a micro element is? It's not size. It's not size. It's concentration. When Jerry kept talking about trace elements, Trace elements we apply in pounds less than 10 pounds per acre, whereas nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are applying in hundreds of pounds per acre. Okay? Did you guys know that calcium is either a macronutrient or a micronutrient? Yes. Based on what Jerry just taught us. Macroelement or a microelement? Macroelement. Okay. Is it a macro element all the time? Depends. I'll bring my mom over here. <laughs> Thank you, young lady. I'm going to put this down. I'm not, I won't touch anything. Okay. I'm going to show these gentlemen and lady the distribution of an element that, be, that starts out as a macronutrient and becomes a micronutrient. Okay? Okay. She has shoes, right? Her feet. She represents a bean plant, okay? A soybean plant, okay? Remember these numbers. Her feet contain 50,000 parts per million, or 5% of, of biomass, of calcium. We move up to her legs, 
it goes down to two to three part of a percent or 20 to 30 parts per million. That's a lot, that's a macronutrient, right? We got to her shirt, her torso, and we're talking about 15,000 parts per million. And we keep dividing and dividing and dividing. We get up to her beautiful head, and we may be talking about 1,000 parts per million. Her hair is between 100 and 300 parts per million. Okay, when we were talking about down here, 30 parts per million to 100 per, 300 parts per million, what percentage of that? 1% or 1% 1 of 1%. Do you see the poorly distributed? That's like my household. I have 10 kids. Yeah, Gina. My wife did anyway. I was just the five minutes. So we the poorly distributed resources in my family, right? The biggest, when he comes to the dinner, he eats first. When the little shit shows up and it's not the left, right? That's called redistribution of resources. This young lady has a really poor distribution of resources, of a macronutrient that really is a micronutrient in the parts that we care about, okay? 90% of calcium is structural. These kind of look cement, but they're not, they're gray. But the walls of this building are cement. The walls of the plant are cement. Calcium, 90% of calcium is structural, right? I'm gonna have to do something really important. Does anybody know what these little things represent? The fruit, okay. We're talking about poor distribution of the macronutrient calcium. You think calcium in the fruit is a macronutrient or micronutrient? Huh? Absent. We'll be lucky if a soybean seed has 100 to 300 parts per million, and the difference between 100 parts per million calcium in a, in a bean pod and 300 parts per million is the density of the fruit. The density of the weight of the seed if you have a poor weight corn crop, a poorly dis distributed resources of a corn crop, what is your, what is your, uh, is it bushels per pound, what is it? Test, uh, yes. test weight. What's your test weight on a poor field versus the test weight of big field? <coughs> or on soybeans? The difference is your ability to get calcium, zinc, manganese to these points. Okay? You, you can't do that. You're hitting your head in the wall. Do you understand? That was a macronutrient. It really isn't a macronutrient for what we sell. A macronutrient for the structure of the plant is enough for what we're trying to do. The secret is to deceive the plant into thinking that I'm going to send this to my growing points, to the most important part of my plant not stay where I put it. The secret is to hide the element in the most important component of human or plant growth as a small protein. Okay, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a side test over here. This is a positive charge, and that's a negative charge. This is a polar molecule, so negative charge, positive charge. This is a neutral charge. You know what else I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make one more change. Instead of having a nitrogen here, I'm gonna put a purple ball, and it's called phosphorus. This is now the second most widely used chemical in the world. Does anybody remember what it is? And here you do. What mode of action does glyphosate have in the plant? Growth rate. No, what mode of action? Your, it, its function might be the growth regulator. It actually stops growth. What does glyphosate? Mode of action is systemic. Remember that word? That's that's like that's like the home run of the word today. Completely and totally systemic. What does that mean? That means that the plant recognizes this molecule. It says, I've got to send this to the growing points. 
Anybody diabetic in here? Don't, no, you don't have to raise your hand. But do you understand if a diabetic person drinks sugar, it changes something in their system. If they drink uh, a sugar-free Coca-Cola, they taste it, but it has no effect. The difference between this in the growing points of the plant and this in the glyphosate in the growing points of the plant is this is an artificial sweetener. The plant sent this to the growing point for the specific purpose because of its structure to say, you need to grow proteins and guess what it does? It doesn't grow proteins. Just like giving a diabetic a sugar-free Coke or a, or a non-Coke because it's artificial. You understand what I'm saying? So what we've done is we have deceived the plant into saying, I need this more than anything else in my physiology in order to continue to grow the growing points of the plant. And all we've done is we've copied nature, so has glyphosate, copied nature, and used it to block protein synthesis, right? Because it gets there and the plant says, I can't use this. This is artificial. This is synthetic. Even though it was systemic, I'm getting this like It was systemic, but it's synthetic. It's fake. This is the most important component a plant can have. So all we've done is we've fooled the plant into saying, every time I apply this material, which is without charge. Have any of you ever, ever gone to the ocean and swim? Remember when we were little kids and go to the ocean? We could be in the ocean on the beach all stinking day. We get in the back of the truck, we're going down the road, and all of a sudden the salt, our skin starts turning white because our body, the skin, has absorbed the salt. If we go to the beach and a wave hits us, and all of a sudden I swallow a, a pint of water, I start throwing up because it's poisonous. My body and the plant has a barrier to taking up things that are not good for it. So all we're doing is we're creating a mechanism to increase the efficiency of nutrient uptake. That's all we're doing. Okay? Am I completely baffled? You can't baffle the bullshit. What is that saying? Dazzle. I'm not going to. That's what Jerry's here for. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to go through in writing this was, this was visual, now we're going to go through more technical. What is this? Okay? It is a patented material that is designed for plant uptake. And I'm going to tell you a secret. The bigger part of my company is for human nutrition. And there's a good possibility that you've already taken in my food, some of my products today. Another part of my business is animal nutrition. The same technology we apply to baby formula and fortified bread and cereals and, and, and everything that's fortified and animals is the same technology we use in plants. Okay? It is chelated now. And then you guys, you guys, Jerry talked a little bit about EDTAs. Is EDTA, does anybody heard of EDTA? Synthetic chelates. They're not natural. That's why it's so hard to apply them to the leaf, even though they're neutral and just without a salt. The plant can allow it, will allow it to get beyond the coffee filter of the leaf. Once it gets in there, the plant goes, What do I do with this idiot? What are you doing here? And they have to create a high energy mechanism in order to take the magnet, the metal off the magnet. Okay? This is the opposite technology. Amino acid chelate proteins. Okay? We've been doing this for over 50 years. Jerry kept saying, Balkan Albion. The reason is, Albion is the mother company that designed this back in the 50s. And Balkan bought us out five years ago, and now we're stuck to a piece of crap. Worldwide. What is key? 
education. How many of you remember a grown or you're a grown? So you really, most people are farmers, are you farmers? Any technical agronomists in the room? Yeah, that's the first time in my life I've ever known one into it. Okay. This claw, kila, the word kila is Greek for claw. And what chelate means is it's a structure that takes a metal and it keeps it from oxidizing or rusting or reacting, okay? That's all that means. This is not a chelate, but that's not potassium. And see the covalent bonding? That's why we can apply. My potassium and my boron have a different technology than this, just for trivia because it's a different chemical, it's a different charge. Okay? They're chemically similar to what occurs naturally. They protect the minerals from rust, from oxidation, and they're rapidly absorbed, well, three things. Rapidly absorbed, because the plant is a copy filter, just like my skin. It has millions of negative charges. If you take a negative charge and a negative charge, they rebel. A negative charge and a positive charge, they attract. 90% of my competition when they apply it to the leaf is stuck on the leaf because the leaf is a filter, it's a copy filter. Rapidly absorbed is negative, it's not neutral charge. It's translocated, mode of action, the same as glyphosate, moved from the leaf to the growing points, and it's metabolized. What does metabolized mean? The plant eats this thing and the and it craps out the metal and goes, hey, how did you get up here? Okay, there's a lot of competition ideas, lignans, a lot of different carriers. Those are vehicles that the industry uses to carry minerals. But look how huge they are, they're massive, chemically speaking. The Dossate's 100% uh, chelated. We have thousands of tests we have to do that because we're in human nutrition. Anything you apply to human nutrition has to be quadruply tested and all that stuff. So anyway. Okay, we're going to go through this kind of fast. There are barriers. If you just take low biurea, which is this little chingadera, remember? If you apply this to the plant, what does the plant do with low biurea? sucks it in immediately, it's without charge, and it plant takes it in and it recognizes the key. This is the key to the car. This is the key to the door. Okay? Complete solubility. Uh, we're gonna go through all of these, so don't go real fast. Okay? Zinc oxide, copper hydroxide, are those soluble or insoluble? Insoluble. When you have put how many of you, when you were younger, you know, we ought to be doing it now, but put that white stuff on our nose to not get sunburned? Zinc oxide, 0% absorption. Remember I told you we have 10 kids? I've gone through a lot of zinc oxide on a lot of bumps, bumps. You know, diaper rash medicine. Insoluble, okay, zinc oxide. realize this is spelled wrong. They're supposed to be phosphites. Phosphites are insoluble. You know how a phosphate works? A phosphite works the same as Roundup. It's or, or aspartame or a sugar-free coke. It, it fools the plant at the growing point thinking, oh, phosphate's here. Phosphate, this is phosphite. This is completely insoluble. I don't even have the enzymes to break this down. I don't even know what to do with this. So it just sits there. We take a leaf analysis after taking a phosphite, we have increased levels of phosphorus and think we've done something nutritionally and it's alive. Okay? Metallicate, completely soluble, absorbed within hours instead of days or weeks. One of the, this is from my technicians over here, one of the things that my competition will say is they'll say, we're going to apply your potassium and we're going to apply my potassium in a week, we're going to come back and take leaf samples, and where we apply my potassium, the leaf sample is going to be higher. Where we apply your sample, there's not going to be any potassium there. You know why? Because mine moved. It left. Within 24 hours, it's not there anymore. OK, 
decay, the cuticle, remember, the epidermis of the plant is waxy in nature, and it also has this leaf structure. This is a coffee filter. What do coffee filters do? They filter out contaminants. When, a, when you apply salt water to a plant, 90% of the salt water gets caught up in here. This isn't salt water. 90% of this makes it completely passed into the, into the cytoplasm and moves to the growing points. You guys will catch up. The cell membrane is exactly the same. Same problems. The cell membrane is really the, the door that says you get to come in or you don't get to come in. The EDTA synthetic chelates cannot pass through the cell membrane, zero. So they have to be moved in the xylem. Do you guys know what the xylem of the is? Arteries and veins. You guys know which one carries oxygen and which one doesn't? Any of you just had open heart surgery recently? One of them constricts and one of them is just a tube. One of them pumps and one of them doesn't. The plant has a very similar mechanism. The plant has veins and arteries. It's called the xylem and the phloem. 90% of the nutrition that comes moves up through the sap flow into the xylem, and the xylem is dead cellulose tissue, lignified tissue. The phloem is living tissue, and they're barriers even though they're right next to each other. So the phloem is saying, I need some water, and it sucks the water, and the salts stay on that side. Unless you deceive the plant, and you put it in a form of a protein, and it goes into the phloem, and it moves to tender points of the plant. It the The size matters. Tiny is important. Okay. I've said all this three or four times. One of the things I need you to understand, how many of you have ever been to like New York or a big city where there's pigeons on the floor and you throw grain on the floor and all the pigeons come? Mexico, every single town is a center. And you go downtown and you throw a popcorn on the ground and all of a sudden a thousand pigeons show up. Where did they come from? Right? This is called incentivize. This protein, this meal, I, I tell you for sure, these two beautiful people right here did not incentivize you guys to come. Okay? You came for a different reason, for the food and to support a friend. It's not because we're pretty. We incentivize the plant to take in the mineral by turning into the smallest piece of steak in the world. That's called donating energy. Most nutrients require energy to take them up. This adds energy when there's a net increase. There's money in your pocket in the plant when you apply this material. Like I said, we bring a big old Piedmont bowl in here and you think you're going to get steak and all you're going to get is down. This is the steak, okay? All good size. Okay, of course we have this this list, and you'll see on here, we have tropical, zinc plus, multi-mineral, there's a few of them crop, crop up. Those are what I call cocktail products. They're mixes of products. And it's very important to understand what, why we have combination products. Some of them have a two to one ratio of zinc to manganese. Some of them have a two to one ratio of manganese to zinc. One of them is, two, is a one-to-one -one ratio of manganese and zinc, and that's MZ. Uh, Multi-mineral, 70% of multi-mineral are macronutrients, calcium and magnesium. So depending upon, as, as we start taking sample, leaf samples, as we start understanding what crop nutrition is and what, what nutrients were, were deficient in our field, that's how we make the decision on which
which mix of those things to apply. And so when you come to a technician, you go, give me a program. We're going, okay, we know we're going to need zinc, we know we're going to need manganese, we're going to need calcium, we're going to need boron, we're going to need molybdenum at different stages. That's how we break the products down. And we, we apply it by uh, soil type, uh, growth stage, different things. The, 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 the rate is usually around a quarter rate. Of the <laughs> Any organic drawers in here? We have a powder line that mimics the human nutrition line, and that's really where it came from. And a lot of companies in Mexico, I would say that 20% uh, of my crop production is organic production. And um, a lot of companies, we were already, we were country when country wasn't cool. We had the organic products before we knew how important the organic product was. The organic was growing. And those are our powders. Okay, and they're more concentrated in protein and they're more concentrated in minerals. Remember, the xylem pathway is one directional. Remember, the flow of pathway is multi-directional. But the flow of pathway goes from the leaf to the growing points, and the xylem pathway goes from the roots to the leaves where there's a lot of stoma, stomata for evaporation. So that's why when we got our young model up here, she showed us how poorly distributed the macronutrient calcium was. The same thing happens with micronutrients. The same dilution effect. All we want to do is we want to fortify the weak points instead of concentrating the strong points. Okay? Flow. The leaf is the starting point. In the xylem, the root is the starting point. The leaf is in the phloem. That's where the, the carbohydrates and the sugars and the proteins are made, and they're moved in the phloem to the leaf, the weak parts. We're just taking advantage of the system that already exists. We can make this up. Okay? It says, metallocyte acts like a neutral, a, a natural, no, acts like a natural occurring chelates in nature. The amino acid chelate disguises the mineral to appear as a protein making it xylem and foam mold. See how that worked? I'm going to do that again. It's going to come back. Okay. The goal isn't to throw rocks at a, at a field and hope we hit something. The goal is to pinpoint with leaf analysis, with soil analysis, with sap analysis, to pinpoint the nutrients that are deficient, trying to anticipate their, net, their need their requirements in the plant with the goal of achieving nutrient balance is the goal. How many times do you go on a field and all these guys are doing is NPK, NPK for the past 30 years and their soil is so disbalanced and their plant is so disbalanced, it's a big beautiful green plant and their seed falls. We're not growing silage, we're growing seed. Okay. We have a program we call Team Analysis Report, Technical Evaluation of Albion Minerals. What the team report does is it takes a reliable piece of information out just like this does a optimal range for that nutrient sometimes the range is ridiculous between a, it's between 100 and 200 parts per million that's like saying you a dollar to a hundred dollars which would be more so I don't know I mean that's not a range see what I'm saying so those ranges don't mean a whole lot because there there's a huge variation but what our program does 
is it takes these and turns it into an index. What this index does is it gives us a negative number or a positive number. The excess amount of material we're applying or the deficiency gives us a relative number of, damn, I'm, I'm at a 50 index of negativity. I, my boron is costing me a crop because my boron levels are so low, it's a negative 50 index. Whereas my iron and copper are in a 100 index positive, which means I have contaminated my soil. This could have been tomato, this is lettuce, but that's really a contamination with fungicides more than anything. I deal with avocados. And what happens during the rainy season, uh, they do a Bordeaux mixture, and it's 25 kilos per hectare of ca copper and calcium oxide. And they mix it up. And for three months of the year, they paint the leaves of the avocado trees blue. Because they're trying to, because during the rainy season, they get anthrax, they get uh, rust, they get all sorts of powder, milk, they get all sorts of diseases. So they just coat them with copper. By the end of the season, all that copper fell down to their organic material, and their organic material is dead because they kill every bacteria in there. Their copper levels are so toxic. We need to be very careful with the things we're applying to the soil because it gives us a residual. How many of you have grown animals? Any of you ever heard of ivermectin? You know that ivermectin has a residual like Roundup and has a, the, the ability to keep your manure from breaking down. There are certain, certain gram-negative bacteria that ivermectin kills that your, back, your, your manure can't break down because it has residual of glyphosate and of We invite you to share with us your leaf analysis so that we can give this report because what it does, instead of you telling me, I need a program, I need a program, this is your program. Your soil, your leaf analysis just told us what your program is going to be for the next six weeks. We're going to divide this into three applications. And that, that is your rate of iron, zinc, manganese, copper, calcium that that particular crop needs at that time for the next six weeks. Okay? You do three applications commonly? In Mexico I do because they put it on a backpack and they spray it with a aspirin. But um, we usually try to do uh, three to four applications in a corn crop, in a soybean crop. We try to start at B4 on corn. Why do we, anybody know what's going on at B4, B5? You're developing the size of your ear. What's happening at B8? Girth and length. What's that? Girth and length. Of the ear. So we focus our energies, and the thing is, remember, if you apply a technology that takes 45 days after your application for it to be effective, you completely miss, it's like, Pitch the ball. And they've already pitched four, and I didn't even know I was ready to, to hit the ball. Okay? We need to understand there's technology that's fast and there's technology that's slow. And just because we're applying a mineral doesn't mean that it's fast. It just means that I applied a mineral. That doesn't mean I got any results out of it. Okay? variability across the field. So if I go out and pull yeah. samples on a 50 acre field, is that going to tell you what everything is or the soil type? Absolutely. How many soils have how many soil types does the average person have on 40 field? Two, three, five. So what I do is that let's just say this is a 40 acre field and there's a band there's an old wash that went through the field that used to drain, I filled it in. This part of the field doesn't represent the rest of the field. What if I had this band that used to be a wash and I filled it, and I, I pushed it in, and then I have a, a, a soil sample that goes through here. I will sample this sample separate, and this sample, and this one I will treat as the average. Because this only represents 10% of the field, and this represents 80% or 90% of the field. Wow. 
like when we're doing SAP test, you would do separate testing. If we're doing SAP test, we need to understand what the, okay, I always tell people, numbers don't lie, but liars use numbers. What do those numbers mean? If we take a sample, and, and I'll, we, we, we talked about this earlier today, if the three of us went into a field and we took a sample, each one of us took our sample in, there would be more variability in this numbers because of our sampling procedure than there would in the, in the soil types. So sampling procedure is super important, but sampling it according to soil type is more important. We have a grower, we're not gonna talk to this week, that has a big animal operation. And what they do is they so they have, let's just say they have a 40 or an 80 acre field, three different soil types. They sample those soil types differently. And where the organic matter is lowest is where they double their rate of manure applications. What is the consequence of doubling your manure applications on certain parts of the field and not parts of the field? Higher salt concentration, higher P and K. What does the P do? It ties up your calcium, more calcium deficiency. It decreases your seed quality because you're applying more manure in order to upgrade your organic matter just in that field. That's not a good procedure. It's better to, and we're talking about bugs in a jug, okay? I don't know if I want to go there, but what is a bug in a jug? You ever heard of the super bug? Superbug is the bug that solves all the problems, right? It's a bacteria that's going to solve, solve the world. If you take a great white shark from Australia and put him in the Amazon River, he's the, is he still the toughest guy in, in the river? They'll eat him for lunch and they're not even leaving bone. He's all carpet. He, there's no trace left. He's poop in 24 hours. Okay? Just because he's a superbug in Australia, doesn't mean he's a super bug in the, Nebraska, okay? We need to work with systems that are already in place, feed them according to their needs, and when we have an event, or what's an event? Wind event, a breeze event, a compaction event, a rain event, a, a saturation event, a drought event, these are all events that change the biology, and what happens when you change the biology? change the chemistry. What happens when you change the biochemistry? Your production goes down. We can't manipulate nature unless we're irrigated, but we can we can buffer the system with supplementation of the materials that actually work. And that's really what we're here for. We all carry technology, we have products that will allow us to uh, meet a uh, minimize the effects of the events. Okay, that's really what we're here. Uh, like I said, hundreds of questions. I, I have this, this theme, and we're, I've been doing this actually for over 30 some years. And the bigger the group, the less questions there is. Why is that? Because there's more people that I might, I'm gonna hide, show the world that I'm an idiot. The biggest idiot is the one who don't ask a question to sit in his head. If there's no bad questions, that's my point. I tell that to my kids all the time. Uh, hey, we've got a, a seven counties in the state of Iowa that have quite a bit of tar spot. And uh, I don't know if you guys have had much problems with it. Wisconsin had a lot of them last year. Uh, I'd like to have Tracy touch on that for a little bit here and talk a little bit about tar spot. Then I'm going to take you down to fungicide road. Same with our crop. 
when we have a susceptible crop. Now, have you guys heard of the, 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 the disease triangle? This is kind of important. The disease triangle, we're going to take us three technicians here. I am the disease causing agent. This guy right here is my corn plant, and this guy right over here is the weather. Right? We blame him. My company told me three years ago, quit using the W word. And I said, you dumb shit's for in agriculture. And they say, no, we make widgets. We sell widgets. Quit using the W word. So if you don't have the perfect combination of the presence of the organism, a susceptible crop, and the environment correct to have the disease, you don't have a disease. I'm over here standing thinking I'm going to cause a problem. He's over there going, I'm too tough for you because I have good nutrition. And he's over there going, I want to cause chaos and you guys are ignoring me. Okay? So we need to understand that what our goal is, and I'm going to say this, what did you say the race horse, the race horse varieties? Does anybody know what that means? What does that mean? molecule to a fungi, a fungi or a bacteria uh, that's trying to 
growing and eating. What, what do you think will happen if I put this on a leaf in a bacteria to go up? The fungal agent is trying to expand its growth. What do you think happens? It consumes it immediately, and this becomes the Trojan horse. Zinc, manganese, and copper biologically becomes a Trojan horse for those diseases. But we have about three questions. I don't know if we two of them, but I don't want to answer them tonight. What do fungicides do? Most fungicides are selective. I'm only going to let blonde girls come up here and be my model. The rest of you guys suffer. What, what selectivity? Well, we do, <clears throat> there's this concept in biology. It's called competitive exclusion. Any of you ever heard that? OK. I'm going to give you an example. All of you guys sitting here at this table, what if an elephant decided he wanted to have this table? Who's going to win? Okay. So what happens is that's called competitive exclusion. Certain organisms, because of their, their characteristics, have the ability to exclude other things. What we do with selective fungicides is we, we say, everybody that's wearing a hat, you're dead. And then I go, everybody that has a beard, you're dead. Everybody that has gray hair, you're dead. And all of a sudden, the only thing that's living are you young guys that can kick my ass. And I'm going, I just created a monster, right? That's how fungicides work. We need to be very careful in applying too many fungicides just because they're there and, I, and I'm scared, you know, I'm scared, so I'm gonna apply this material. And all we did is we created the monster that is now, uh, what, what do you call it, the car spot. It's a new disease and it's a monster. Same thing happens to the same, same exact thing. We start, you, you guys have heard of the white fly? Oh, lucky. I'm from Arizona and we created the white fly. It is now a worldwide phenomenon. And we created it because of our selective use of pesticides that without changing the biology, we created a monster is like, imagine having aphids that have wings that can move from here to there in five seconds, and they multiply faster than aphids. That's a white fly. That's a monster. But just, we need to start being smart with the things we're doing. We can't just keep applying NPK, 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 and think <coughs> Think that I'm going to get 150, so I'm going to put 1,500 milliliters in a liter jug and think that there's not going to be an effect. Math just don't work that way. The dilution effect is real, and sometimes we're the reason that our plant is poorly, has poor nutrition. In Mexico, when I see this look on their face, I go, fool, when the gas tank is fool, fool, we're done. How are we doing, you guys? I'm here to help you out if you have any questions. And Mal del Pueblo, questions? No, we're here. I was just talking about pesticide, and some of us here grow up out, but freaking weevil. There's nothing, you can't kill it. How do you control that? Because you know, Moore's band is gone. Not Mexico. <laughs> They're still using bay pads, uh, fuselade, no, beer dad, motor uh, pad, malacon, they got everything. It's all coming from China. It's all coming from China. The thing is, you need to understand the solution to pollution, anybody from the 70s here besides me, is dilution. The solution to pollution is dilution. 90% of the chemicals that come to us from China have byproducts that they're trying to dump on us because they say the solution to this nasty thing is applying agriculture is no longer a problem. 
we have we are the consumers of a bunch of toxins that they're byproducts they're dumping into the pesticides for us. Isn't that great? We ought to thank them. They ought to thank us for getting rid of their toxic waste piles. They don't have the battle like we do. attracts the most leaves. Nutrient balance in the growing points. I don't know any other company that has technology that goes from the leaf to the growing points instead of the opposite. Most of the people who apply nutrients, the nutrients build up in the older tissue and don't arrive at the younger tender tissues. That's as good as I can do by now. Sorry. Boron and zinc that is systemic and moves to the growing points will repel weevil. So when does the weevil come in? Is it in the fall? No, mm, uh, you mean when do they lay on the ground and go to sleep for yeah, six months? Yeah, when are they there? Are they there all the time? All the time. And remember, a crop is an attractive. I'll give you another example. I'm in, a, in Chihuahua, that's where they grow their apples. And we're, here, here's a road, right? I'll put the road here. So here's our road. One brother, another brother's apple orchard. They divided the bee colonies to the, both farms. These guys are using my materials, and these guys aren't. Where do you think the bees are going? <laughs> to the rich, well nutrition pollen. A bee knows the difference between crappy pollen and nu nutrient dense pollen. The weakest dog attracts the leaves. Okay? It's the same with crops. You can, you, can, you can see it. You can go down a road 
And you can pick out his customers and the ones that aren't his customers just by the disease pressure, just by their stress, their response to certain stresses, just for their response to um, events. Yes or no? How are we doing? Okay, I'm going to teach you another thing. This is English Spanish. Okay. Okay? This is English. Ear. This is nose. This is jaw, right? In Spanish, ear is to go. Nose means us. Let's go now. That's my cue word to my technician to go. It was baseball stuff. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. Uh, yeah.